what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I'm here with Dada Caldwell of Moon Clerk. And before I formally introduce you, Dada, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out. And um, people should check out, and we'll, we'll get a little bit into this, um, Rob Walling. Uh, episodes with Rob Walling. He hosts the, the conference MicroConf, which I know Dada has spoken at, which is for bootstrapped SaaS companies. Um, check it out. Uh, he's He started... Uh, get drip and um, just an amazing entrepreneur and person. Check it out. Um, founder of Zapier, um, Wade Foster. Check that one out. Check out uh, the founder of A Weber. Also, uh, you know they've been doing email marketing. I think since I don't know, like ninety eight or something. Dad and Kevin McArdle, uh, who gives bootstrap businesses SaaS uh, founders their dream exit. I was talking before we hit record. I was like. There is an episode, you know, that I think he should purchase you one day. You're like, well, we're not for sale. I'm like, no worries, you know, but Kevin, if you're listening, just keep an eye on dad, you know, maybe, maybe 10 years from now when he's ready, uh, you guys could strike a deal. Um, that and many more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Dad, I've found no better way to give to my relationships over the past decade to have on my podcast, to profile them, the companies and the people I love and admire. And I love Moon Clerk. We use Moon Clerk actually. And I'm like, why haven't I had on Dad on the podcast yet? I love what they're doing and let's tell more people about it. So if you've thought of podcasting, if you're a business, I believe every business should. I've been saying this for over a decade. Uh, if you've thought about it, do it. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com, email us. Happy to answer any questions that you have. And today's guest, Dodd Caldwell, is the co-founder of Moonclerk. Like I said, Moonclerk's a web-based software company that helps businesses accept one-time and recurring payments online without any coding. So if you're out there thinking, and we'll go a little bit deeper on this, what's like one of the most important things, if not the lifeblood of any business, which is money. And how do you get paid? How do you accept payments easily? How do you make it easy for people to pay you, right? I mean, I love when people make it easy for me to pay them as a customer. And I love actually when they put me on recurring payments, so I don't have to worry about it. And it just comes out. Um, and so your, your clients, you know, if you, even if you use Stripe, there's a more elegant, better solution that gives you more control and um, I suggest everyone, I, you know, I told you this before, Dad, that I suggest everyone use Moonclerk for their business, uh, especially if you know, we're an agency. If you're an agency out there, I know you have consulting companies, coaches, there's so many use cases for it. Um, he also runs Rice Bowls, which is a creative nonprofit that partners with grassroots orphanages in eight countries to feed hungry children. Um, and previously founded an e-commerce company, which he sold. Um, and led an international chain sales efforts for his family's manufacturing business. So, Todd, thanks for joining me. Ah, thanks for having me. Thanks for being a, a great customer as well. Yeah. You know, so why did you start Moonclerk? Well, um, it started out of a failed, a pre, another failed startup. Um, so, uh, actually, my, I was working... Uh, I know the nonprofit world fairly well uh, with I'm volunteer president of, um, of Rice Bowls, as you mentioned. And I was actually, this is kind of pre Squarespace days and, you know, easy CMS and, and things like that. And I was uh, trying to start, and I did start a, uh, a company that helped uh, nonprofits um, create uh, kind of like instant uh low maintenance uh websites um and this was again er, kind of early days of you know website builders and all that um and actually my business partner ryan wood in Moonclerk, uh who is our cto he was actually contracting with me um and kind of ended up kind of leading the development work on that um that business failed um and but kind of one of the bright spots of that failure 
was that the one thing that kind of works that people liked, these nonprofits liked, was we had integrated in uh, recurring donations. Um, and then the business, I think the max I ever made was enough to maybe go to Chipotle once a month, take the, take the team to Chipotle once a month with that. And it, so it didn't last very long. It's kind of hard to sustain that when you're, when you're bootstrapped. Um, but that kind of gave, uh, you know, kind of gave the idea of, um, okay, wait a second. What if, uh, it, you know, if nonprofits are kind of struggling with this, and again, this is a while back, uh, nine years ago, um, you know, if they're struggling with how to accept recurring donations, my guess is there are other small businesses who would like to accept recurring payments who are maybe having trouble automating um, that. Um, and actually at the time, we, we're built on top of Stripe. And at the time, I think Stripe was like 10 people, 12 people, a person startup. Wow. Like, That's you know, amazing. it was like, that, unless you were like really deep into the payment space, you had not heard of them or anything like that. And I mean, early days, I think, you know, they're probably now a uh, worth hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, um, you know, kind of most recent valuations and what the IPO at and everything. But I mean, the founders were doing our customer support, you know, uh, back then, the, Coll the Collison brothers. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in at the time, there really, you had to be a developer to be able to implement recurring payments and use pretty, still use pretty expensive software and still go get like a payment gateway at your bank, go down, get, you know, merchant account and all that. Or you had to use PayPal. And PayPal's system was not really built for businesses to accept recurring payments. It was, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer type. That was what it was originally mm -hmm. built for, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, payments. So that there are other kind of issues with, for, you know, business. I mean, some businesses do use PayPal, but there's other issues I've heard with, account freezes and other things with PayPal. So I take that back with Kevin McCarley. You just have Stripe purchase you. <laughs> I don't know. I think we're, uh, we're small. Hey, Patrick, um, I think you should acquire us because <laughs> we have these features. <laughs> I think well, we enjoy what we do. And yeah. uh, I think we're uh, I don't know why I'm trying to sell off your company, but I'm, I know. I don't I'm know just why. brainstorming on this call. I'm thinking, wow, yeah, yeah. Stripe should look into Moon Clark, you know? <laughs> um, why, you know, so talk for a second that about why, if someone's like, well, I already use Stripe, why use Moonclerk as well? What do you tell people? Sure. Well, I mean, just like I said, uh, PayPal was originally built for peer-to-peer, person-to-person. Stripe was originally built for developers. Um, and they absolutely, I mean, it sounds weird. It kind of happens sometimes when you have vendors or whatever that kind of become slight competitors so i mean there definitely is a certain aspect of that of now they offer more features that did not used to exist you literally had to be a developer 100 percent to use them in the past but we also have uh over time added a lot of we we have a lot of value add on top of um what stripe does um you know heavy uh, uh, integrations in with MailChimp, uh, digital delivery system. We have like a form builder where you gate, gather data and then we have uh, a pretty robust email notification system to the account as well as to the person paying. And you can populate and those emails with like data from the checkout, including the form builder and custom information uh, that you're getting. and. I would say maybe two other, like a couple, I mean, there's more than that, but just a couple other like big picture things. I think it's easier to use for non-technical people. I mean, we're, we literally built this from the ground up uh, from day one for people who are not developers and not technical. Um, and we've intentionally kept features out that Stripe has so as not to confuse. And then I also think um, being, we're a small business. Um, and so I, I believe we provide great support for individual small, our, our customers are small businesses, whereas Stripe is a huge company now and probably doesn't provide the type of support that we do for non-technical users, given that their bread and butter is dealing with, um, with developers and also a lot of, I mean, they do have small businesses, but a lot of large uh, businesses as well. 
So I would like to think that we, we provide a certain personalized uh, level of support, which I think a lot of small businesses care about. Um, because I'll say from my standpoint, language. dad, you know, what, what I like, um, I tell people you should switch or not switch, but like get it because one email notifications you mentioned, it's funny because with Stripe and you, if, if a payment fails, it will send some kind of message to the person. It does not send to the business through Stripe. You, can, you cannot get a notification. And that alone is worth getting, Moon Clark, in my opinion. Getting an actual notification from you or from, um, from Moon Clark or that the payment didn't go through. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, right? And then the other thing is the ACH, you know, like we're all, all any business that it, it's, it's like we were talking before we hit record, like the non sexy stuff, like the payment processing space is not a sexy space unless you actually have a business, which is very sexy because you need to get paid and then you realize these little fees add up. Mm -hmm. So I know with you can, you can chart, you use ACH and do a recurring ACH through Moon Clerk. So if you don't want to pay the processing fees, you can actually set a recurring payment through ACH um, with Moon Clerk as well. Or if you're using Stripe natively, I don't, you maybe have to be some kind of genius coder to do that somehow. So yeah, I think you also, when you do it with natively, yeah, you would have to probably, I think, do your own custom coding. And they also use what are called micro deposits, which is where your, your customer would have to come back in, like, yes. check their bank account, come back in three days later. They deposit like 17 in cents. And yeah, you all that. And, Whereas yeah. ours uh, is like automated, basically use your online banking credentials and it's automatically uh, approved. Yeah. Um, so those where, two features for me is what I tell people. And I, I don't get anything, by the way, when people sign up for Moon Clerk, but I just, just to be a, a nice person to them, I think it benefits them to, to do that just on those two features alone. Um, and so I'd love to talk about, um, you know, micro comp for a second and what you learned, you know, and you made a conscious decision, I think early on to bootstrap the company as opposed to taking funding. So I'd love to take, you know, hear your thoughts on that and, and maybe some of the kind of role in the conversation of some of the things you've learned from your other peers at microconf or wherever who are also bootstrapped. So why bootstrap? Sure. Yeah. We, Ryan, my business partner and I, when we were like kind of setting out to build this, um, we didn't really even have the desire to build like a unicorn billion dollar startup. The goal was to have a profitable self-sustaining business that provides for our families like a work environment small team work environment that we enjoy uh working in a product that we enjoy working with and we like solving problems uh and other people's problems and that was like one of the things that was like oh this is actually like a legit thing that small businesses like have a problem with and we can help solve it. And that's kind of fun and it feels um, rewarding. And we, we, so we didn't really set out to have that unicorn uh, status. I think, you know, there's, you know, there's all, all different ways. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's all different ways of looking at, at it. I believe it is a, even though it's still not a high probability of success of any starting any business, but there's a higher probability if you're trying to start just a small profitable um, business than trying to be a billion dollar startup. Uh, you also can kind of control your own uh, your own company versus having a board and investors. Um, that's an advantage. Have to live a little bit more sane lifestyle where you're not like killing yourself. Um, you know, working uh, 24, 24, seven. Um, and I have some, like, I guess some theories around that and how teams should like work, uh, from a speed standpoint and effort standpoint. But, um, yeah, those are, those are kind of the businesses. So, you know, that was kind of why going bootstrapped, um, was right. It's not right for everybody, but it was right for, um, right for us. 
One of the things that you talked about at MicroConf when you spoke was about raising prices. And I know that every company, whether it doesn't matter what you are, SaaS company, service company, kind of struggles with maybe with the mindset of raising prices on a lot and a lot of different levels. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on on raising prices, whether it's your comp- SaaS company or someone else listening to this. Do it. Okay. <laughs> That's my advice. No, uh, uh, it uh, obviously you have to be providing value and have something that people want and are willing to exchange their money for uh, in order for it to work. But I do think, and we we may still we may underprice um, our product. I have found that. Um, we haven't seen, we, we, we've really only raised our prices like twice, one of those being fairly recently. Um, and some of it was like, literally our own costs had increased and it was like, okay, we've got to like offset. There were different things we needed. We just kind of like needed to offset, but you know, it had been years since we had raised our, um, our prices. I, I think overall, um, you, know, you try to make an educated um, decision. Obviously, we, we started at, you know, our prices just recently raised from like, I mean, it doesn't sound like much, but for our lowest tier, went from $15 to $18. Other tiers went up as well, but not by like, a, you know, a great percentage. And it's still scary even going up like $3. No, I think there is a big difference. Okay, if you decide to go from starting off at $15 to starting off at $300, you're going to be attracting a completely different market. I mean, you're basically changing the market you're in. So we weren't necessarily um, doing that, but we found generally if people are really upset by those uh, pricing changes, like from 15 to 18 or whatever, and I don't mean this uh, in a bad way, they probably weren't going to be good customers anyway. Um, And, you know, you would rather... I don't want to, I think there's a healthy medium of, I don't want to have a business where I have two customers that make up hundred percent of my revenue. Um, you know, I like having a diversified um, a stream of a lot of different customers, but at the same time, for instance, I mean, you would rather have, you know, if you're doing hundred million in revenue, which we're not, uh, you, you would probably, I mean, I don't know if you want to have a hundred million $1 customers. You'd probably like to have some larger because that's 100 million people you're doing customer support for that, uh, are, you know, potential bugs, uh, all that. So there's a healthy medium there. And even if, you know, in raising your prices, you lose some customers, if your revenue per customer is increasing in your top line, um, you know, I don't necessarily think that's the worst thing in the world to lose kind of maybe net customer count, if you will. But you probably won't do that even as long as you're not like doing some kind of crazy price increase. So how do you communicate that? So you mentioned, okay, we're going to raise prices. All right. You make the decision mm-hmm. across the board. And I guess some people will, um, again, we're not talking like huge increase or anything, but I know some people will just increase it across the board. Some people may, some companies may grandfather people in. Um, mm-hmm. So there's that, but let's say you're just going to go across the board. We're going to, increase everyone. Um, how do you decide what's scary to you as a business owner? And then how do you communicate that to the customers? So we've done both. We, the first time we raised our prices, we grandfathered people in and, you know, it took much longer for that to have any type of material effect on our business. Um, and in this time, uh, most recently, you know, in 2021, we raised our prices um, we did it, do it across the board for even existing, uh, existing customers. And some of that was like our prices were increasing like behind the scenes. Um, and so it was to offset that and it wasn't going to have a material impact unless we did that. But we also were like, we provide a lot more value than we did X number of years ago. Um, so we didn't feel bad about it necessarily. We also communicated it um, well ahead of time. I can't remember if it was 60 or 90 days. Um, so giving people a heads up. And I, I, I think I put in there like, hey, this, 
if you want to move away from us or whatever, that you have plenty of time, we're not holding your data hostage, you know, anything like that. We send a reminder of, you know, maybe 30 days out of, hey, here, this pricing change is happening. Um, and, you know, so we didn't want to like hide it from customers, surprise it. You want to give people uh, time to digest and move away if they decide that you're not the right solution um, for them anymore. I mean, you don't want to like control people. Nobody likes that. Um, so uh, we did that, but we were also, um, we let people know our prices had increased, uh, you know, and that was one thing, but we also let them know about some things that we had done that kept them from having price increases with Stripe. Uh, and because Stripe has changed up their billing model and we've decided, hey, we're going to absorb some of that for you. So you're not incurring these, uh, these other expenses. And I think people are really understanding. I think I got like one or two like thank you emails, which is not what you would expect or thank you tweets. I can't remember, maybe a thank you email, a thank you tweet um, and of people thanking them. Hey, you guys have provided a great product and it's been working for us for a number of years. This is a total re totally reasonable like uh, cost increase. Um, yeah. So that's so what I'm hearing that is like, it's really important to not just let people know, but to share the value of what they're getting and providing um, and why, and the reasons why there is an increase so that they're like, actually, you know, thanking you because like, here's the other stuff that we're including. Here's the stuff we're working on and here's where it's going towards. Yeah. Well, I hate to use maxims and say like that applies for everybody. Cause there probably are some people who are way undercharging and they just should increase their prices in our specific use case. Yeah. I worked a long time on crafting those communications uh, and wording those communications uh, so that um, they were most easily digestible by our, um, our customers. And why does it make you scared? Because we're business owners and things are, running a business is scary and change is scary. And you're, you have those fears of you're going to lose your business and everybody's going to, you know, you raise your prices, but from 15 to $18 and man, like half your customers are going to leave and, find <laughs> else, and then you're going to, you know, what are you going to do? And you're going to be destitute. That's why it's scary. I don't yeah. know. I'm curious. I don't know if you remember what it was, but do you remember the subject line you decided to use when I could see you kind of crafting this and, you know, people always read, you know, see the subject line first. Do you remember the subject line you used when you sent the email out by chance? I do not, but oh, okay. I know I did not. I don't believe in either the subject line or the very start of the body of the email. I didn't bury the lead. I was up front. We're raising our prices. And here's what's happening here. Here's where they're going, you know? Um, so I think, cause I think that that's one thing I, you know, in, in thinking it through, like if you bury the lead, it kind of feels like people are like, wait a second. The whole reason of this email is like down here and you're kind of like pulling one over on them, you know, trying to like sugarcoat it. And I mean, I did sugarcoat it in a sense, but I just didn't like hide it. Um, you know, don't bury, don't bury the lead because I think people, people see right through that. You know, you know I love to hear, Dad, you know, what you've learned from any colleagues or mentors kind of in the SaaS space. I don't know if it's someone you, you know, Rob or someone else you met there, but what's, who are some of your colleagues or mentors and some of the lessons? Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you a few things I learned at MicroConf. Does that, does that work? That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of them is uh, really practical. Um, very, very practical. It's actually paid many times over this one, maybe 10 minute talk, every micro conf, I, my business partner and I have been to like every year it pays for it many times over. It is uh, research um, and development tax credit. Hmm. And I had no clue that this software businesses could take advantage of that. And I mean, one of our biggest expenses is our payroll. Um, you know, developers. And basically, you're able to not just get a deduction, you're able to get a tax credit. I mean, it's complicated. Uh, but, you know, if you have an, a, a competent kind of consultant, there's consultants on uh, that type stuff. Um, you know, you can save a lot on taxes. That's a boring thing. But literally, it was just like, oh, and I, literally, I went back and 
talked to found like just Googled it, like consultant for research and development tax credit. Almost feels like software. free money. Yeah, it was like it was like just it's like, oh, all of a sudden every year I apply for it and I get it and it's just like free money and it pays for the conference over and over and over and over. Uh I, I mean that's something I think most like small SaaS businesses don't even like think about. And it's not that hard to, uh, that hard to get. Um, so I, I'm kind of, I always find tax law um, interesting. I don't know why. Um, and I like paying my taxes and being honest with them and everything, but that was like a cool, uh, cool thing. Um, <laughs> another one was actually is funny because I listened to this whole talk uh i think the guy's name is lars i can't remember and his whole talk gave a really long like keynote talk about um how to optimize your funnel having these teams that are doing all this like conversion rate optimization all this kind of stuff you have to do it you have to do it you have to do it all this kind of stuff and man i was so i remember leaving it almost kind of like depressed a little bit of like we're not doing that like that sounds so, what that he's doing is so complicated. It requires such a huge team. And how much am I missing out by not doing this? How much revenue am I missing out? And then he came out with a blog post, like, I don't know, a year or two later. And he's like, uh, yeah, pretty much everything I just said, um, kind of forget, uh, I'm not doing that anymore. And I don't think you should be doing it. And it was kind of funny. Like, that's why I said, I don't like giving maxims. I don't like saying you have to do this. You have to do that. I'd rather tell stories and maybe people can find little nuggets from them that work for them because they know their business uh, better than better than I do and or ever will. Um, and it was one of those interesting things like even the experts even, you know, aren't always right. They don't necessarily know more than you. We're all figuring this out uh, on our own. And um, it was sort of like, ah, when I read that blog post, I was like, those were the concerns I had. The ones that he was like, here's why we stopped doing it. It was those things in the back of my mind. I was like, well, this is why I think it may not work. Or that's maybe not a good idea. But I mean, he's given a keynote speech and, you know, it's like, I feel like I should be doing all this stuff. So you got to kind of do what's what works for your business. But also like, you know, again, take nuggets. There's probably nuggets in that speech. I, I learned things from uh, and applied. But overall, it was uh, um learning experience even just seeing him switch a little bit his thought pattern and more power to him a lot of people that give a keynote speech and talk about this whole thing they're not going to then go in and say oh yeah i don't actually recommend doing that anymore because i've learned uh, from it a lot of people stick to their guns and aren't going to like publicly go out and and really what he did helped more people by doing that because he taught what he learned from his mistakes. You know, it wasn't, I don't think he, he wasn't being, uh, he didn't have bad intentions when he gave that speech at MicroConf um, about, you know, conversion rate optimization. Things are always changing in that universe and world and people also change their worldview as well. So it totally makes sense. Um, yes. You know, any other mentors in the business for you or colleagues that you, when you need advice on something, um, you will call? Uh, you know, um, my dad's an entrepreneur and he's had a business since the, uh, since the seventies, it's in manufacturing completely different, but you know what? What do they manufacture? Home fragrance products. Oh, nice. Yeah. Candles, all that kind of stuff. Uh, um, completely different industry, but, um, you know, every industry has its pros and cons. Uh, and it also, every industry ha has its similarities and differences. And I think sometimes you can learn a lot by talking to people in other industries and you can get sort of, you know, a little too insulated and just talking to like people in SaaS and you can, I think when you, you can get a better perspective, time perspective too by looking at businesses that have been around since the seventies that are in man, you know, manufacturing. And I know like, it's not always like this. When you have a business that's like sustainable, you're going to have bad years. You're going to have good years. And I think that's one of the things with SAS is it's like, man, if you're not like doing this every year and a lot of people, cause if you have one that's, that's growing and it's working, um, it is like that for the first X number of years. And I think, people think it's always going to be like that. And it doesn't have to be. 
Um, and you're going to have ups and downs, uh, revenue wise or, or whatever. And, um, uh, so just having that time perspective, it also keeps you humble. I was at a conference once, I think it was in, in, uh, more power to these guys. And I'm not trying to actually, I don't want to like downplay anybody, but I think it was the guys who started Instagram, you know, they, when they sold it to Facebook, they were in like their early twenties. And I remember I was at a conference and they were speaking, like it was like right after they had sold it. And I remember thinking, listening to them, I think, and they've probably got a different perspective now because they are older and wiser and all that. And they were obviously very, they were and are very smart. So no, not trying to diss them in any way, but it was like, the, I believe their perspective back then is this is easy. This is how it works. You know, you start this business, you uh, create this uh, technology, you get people on it, you sell it for a billion dollars, you know? That's what happens. That's the recipe. Right? Yeah, it's like, you know, it's like, that, that's, what, that's what we're all doing here, you know? And I was like, oh my gosh, they, yeah, that's, you know, but when you can see businesses that have been around for 30 years or whatever, and I'm sure they have a different perspective now, probably not, maybe I'm reading in wrong into what they were saying at that at that time as well um but because it was also hard back then you know early days so i knew it wasn't always like that 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 is literally hit, hitting the lottery like building an, uh, an instagram and it was one of the reasons why we like i said we didn't want to build a business from the ground up to be a unicorn um we wanted to have a sustainable you know small business is there something that sticks in your mind dad from either observing your dad or something he told you as a business lesson hmm. interesting well um gosh i'm trying to think of anyone it's hard because like you know if somebody's been your dad for your entire life to <laughs> distill it down and think of like one uh one specific thing i don't know that I, if i gave you an answer right now it may be disingenuous because i don't know if i can think about that it's like a lifetime yeah. of, no worries yeah i figured sometimes something jumps out um, I will say, I can, I can tell you another one. I had uh, in high school, one of my um, friend's dads ran a large commercial construction business. And I, I did look at him, his name is Jim Sanders. And I looked at him as sort of a, a mentor as well, because I was always interested in like entrepreneurship and how businesses run. And ours growing up, our business was actually in our backyard, basically. It was like across the creek through these woods. And it, you know, we basically had the house on the property, essentially. And but anyway, this friend's uh, dad, um, I think he had uh, maybe had a rough day, rough week with employees dealing with <laughs> HR issues. And I remember he put his hand on my shoulder and he goes, Dodd, if or when you ever start a business, try to find one that doesn't require a ton of employees. <laughs> <laughs> I think I everyone. And I have a small business and it's like, you know what? You can hire people that do a good job and you know, you don't have to micromanage and you don't have a ton of HR issues and all that kind of stuff. And that always like kind of stuck with me. It's kind of funny, but it, it, it kind of always stuck with me. I think a lot of people have some of those days that that is yeah. the case, and, yeah. but um, people are the lifeblood as well. So it goes on both, both sides. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's why I say that like half in jest, yeah, you know, totally. and there's tons of businesses that, uh, you know, you have to have a ton of people and there's tons of people that love managing a ton of people. And that, that gives them like, that's like fun and energizing for them. And that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Don, first of all, I have one last question, but thank yeah. you. Thanks for sharing some of the lessons and knowledge, some of the journey. Um, everyone could check out moonclerk.com to learn more um, and look and see what they, they're working on there. Uh, last question that I always like to ask this of specifically SaaS founders, which is uh, tech stack. You know, you're a SaaS founder. I'm curious, what stuff do you like to use internally or externally um, as far as the technology goes? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we're built on Ruby on Rails um, as kind of the, you know, framework. Um, I'm not a developer. My business partner is a developer. I run the business side of things. But, I mean, we, uh, you know, we obviously use Stripe um, as well as a key part of how we bill, as well as bu building Mooncart on top of uh, our business. We use, you mentioned Zapier, we use uh, Zapier. That's probably something I more use um, because it's a, uh, uh, you don't have to be a developer uh, to use that. Um, 
we use intercom for uh you know customer support um help docs uh we use dado as our cms gatsby for like that's for our like marketing site um i mean probably no we use heroku uh you know they're built on and they're built on top of aws we use them for uh hosting uh the app um google suite for uh um you know email and that stuff and uh base camp for our uh project management development intercompany communications documentation kind of run the business through um uh through base camp awesome yeah i love it dad thank you so much thanks for what you do everyone check out moon clerk and we'll see everyone next time thanks everyone thanks jeremy what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.